Well, a urethra, of course, is the tube that urine passes through from the bladder to the outside world. So it starts at the bladder neck and out ends at the tip of the urethra. And the urethra is the tube in various different component parts. So there's a lining membrane on the inside, and then there is a fairly elastic supporting connective tissue layer around that is sufficiently flexible to be able to distend to allow urine out, but also to collapse when the control muscle within the urethra tightens to hold urine in. And that uh, tightening is a consequence of contraction of the urethral sphincter mechanism, which is actually in around about the middle zone of the urethra in women. It's up the top end, just below the apex of the prostate in men. A urethral stricture can arise from many causes and uh, by and large you can say that it's extremely unusual in women, although you may have functional obstruction of the urethra which simulates stricture. A true stricture in the absence of trauma is rare in women. In men it's much more common. It is rare before puberty, it then becomes unusual until around about the age of 50, and then it becomes increasingly common with age until you get past the age of uh, 70 or thereabouts when it really is quite common. Overall, it affects about 1% of men across the entire age spectrum, uh, but the mass majority are in 60 and 70 year olds. The causes in men, other than age-related change with advanced age, are usually a consequence of either trauma of one sort or another or infection. And that infection could be, in the good old days before antibiotics, a disease such as gonorrhea, that becomes less and less common these days and what people forget is that in the pre-antibiotic era when it was not possible to give the appropriate treatment uh, actually you have to get gonorrhea many times to be sure of getting a stricture at that site it's unusual just from a single episode these days, as I say, that's very uncommon, if only because recurrent urinary infection other than gonorrhea is also very uncommon for the same reason because of the availability of antibiotics. The extreme end of the spectrum is a result of major trauma, either a fall astride injury uh, onto the bulbar urethra leading to a crush and crush may be se severe enough to actually sever the urethra or it might be as a result of a pelvic fracture related injury, typically uh, a car crash in the UK. In countries such as India, it's more likely to be somebody on a bicycle getting knocked over uh, so they fall off the bike and then get run over by the same car. But it can, of course, happen with any type of uh, injury, depending on what form of transport is available in the country we're talking about. And then the vast majority of patients have a stricture for no apparent reason. And the only thing that one can say about this is that there are a group of patients, probably the largest group of patients in what you might call the developed world, who have a stricture that becomes apparent in early 20s, sometimes a bit earlier, sometimes a bit later, but typically in young adult life, which occurs precisely at the junction of the middle third and proximal third of the bulbous segment of the urethra, so about two to four centimetres beyond the prostate and the urethral sphincter mechanism, which is almost like a membrane at that site. And this is at such a specific site 
and at such a specific age that it's thought by some, including myself, that this is actually a congenital stricture, that the urethra is born with a small caliber at birth, and then as the uh, urethra gets older, the stricture doesn't, and it just stays um, tight and then becomes obstructive past puberty. So that's the most common cause where it's probably best to say it is idiopathic bulbar stricture. And then the second commonest overall is probably as a consequence of instrumentation when you get uh, strictures more typically uh, in the penile segment of the urethra as a result of catheterization or a result of instrumentation for whatever reason, typically a cystoscopy. Most people just present with steadily increasing difficulty in voiding. Because it is the most common, the idiopathic stricture I've just referred to may well give little in the way of symptoms at all because most people don't watch each other pee and so they are not aware of slowing of the stream because as it's possibly congenital they've always had a slow stream and it's only when they go to the pub or something and stand at a uh, urinal with somebody next to them and they've started and um, somebody else comes in, has a pee, goes away, and somebody else comes, and they're still standing there. And so these people may have no symptoms at all until it is so severe or until they run into a complication of which the commonest complication is urinary tract infection. And whereas some men will accept having a single urinary infection without getting upset about it, uh, if they've had two or three infections, then they will certainly uh, go and see their GP. So recurrent urinary infection would be the next most common. Left to its extreme, a stricture may present with uh, declining renal function as a result of upper urinary tract involvement in the obstructive process and maybe even renal failure. These days, that's rather uncommon. It affects it, as I've just indicated, uh, either by infection or alternatively uh, by um, progressive upper tract obstruction. So the bladder gets affected first of all, generates high pressures to void. Then that pressure is transmitted upwards through the ureters to the kidney. The kidneys then come under uh, the need to work under high pressure to get the urine produced, and that progressively leads to hydronephrosis and loss of renal function. That's comparatively uncommon these days, as I've just explained, uh, but nonetheless, that is what happens and can sometimes happen when you've got a combination of outflow obstruction due to a stricture and maybe prostatic obstruction as well, age-related, so that you've got two causes of obstruction rather than one, uh, which just accelerates the whole process. Well, it depends on what you mean by effective. Um, the most effective in that it is most likely to be able to cure a patient is urethroplasty. Um, but equally, urethroplasty means at the very basis, you need to find a doctor and then the doctor needs to find a hospital and the hospital has to have an operating theater and an anesthetist and beds and staff and all that sort of business to be able to allow inpatient treatment. Until basically after the Second World War, it was more typical to treat most patients by urethral dilatation, where all you need do is have a metal instrument that you pass up the urethra to stretch up the site of the obstruction. And assuming the uh, dilator would pass, then that would take care of the stricture. Inevitably, 
in most patients, it would need to be repeated, but nonetheless, because it could be done in an entirely outpatient setting with minimum equipment and with relatively minimum training and experience to be able to do it, it is still most widely used around the world and it is effective in the sense that you can do it relatively easily, quickly, uh, without any great facilities or hoo-ha. Um, in between, there is minor surgery, and the best example of that is what's called uh, internal urethrotomy, when typically with a cystoscope, in the urethra, you see the stricture, that's the visual bit. And then at the tip of the instrument, you can push through a little blade, which will open up the stricture um, to remove the obstruction. That requires the hospital, the kit and all of the rest of it, and a degree of experience, all of which make it sort of in between the dilatation and the urethroplasty. Uh, for most people, the distinction is between dilatation and urethrotomy on the one hand, because of course most dilatations are done in a hospital setting in the UK, albeit not necessarily there throughout the world, particularly in Southeast Asia and countries like that. And so that would be at one end of the spectrum. And then where you have an experienced individual who can do urethroplasty surgery, then they would go for that type of treatment in patients who are having significantly recurrent problems and uh, were young enough and fit enough to be rid of the problem.